Welcome to Catholic Publishing 101, a podcast of the Association of Catholic Publishers, better known as the ACP. Our goal is to give Catholic authors and editors insights into the challenges and obstacles in publishing Catholic content. I'm your host, Therese Brown, the Executive Director of the ACP, and today we have a special guest joining us for an insightful conversation on traditional versus self-publishing. Please welcome Erica McIntyre, a very talented and tireless writer and editor who has worked in media and publishing for more than 20 years, including a stint as editor-in-chief and then editor-at-large of Writer's Digest. Erica has an incredible breadth of experience working across genres, formats, and industry. She's one of those truly gifted and gracious people who understands the vocation of Catholic publishing and enjoys nurturing talent. Erica, it's great to have you on the show. I am so happy to be here, Therese. (laughs) Well, let's start with some definitions. There are three words that keep popping up, traditional, self-publishing, and hybrid publishing. How would you best describe what each of these three are, like, what are the major differences among them, the pros and cons of each? Okay, there's there's a lot to cover here, but we'll try to give the, uh, the nutshell upshot, if you will. Um, traditional publishing is the publishing that I think probably everyone in the audience is most familiar with. You go to the bookstore, you pull a book off the shelf in the uh, Catholic or religion section, and it has... Ave Maria Press on the spine, or Paulus Press on the spine, or Franciscan Media on the spine, or we all the different dozens of Catholic publishers that we have. And traditionally, that traditionally published book got there because an author wrote a book, uh, pitched it to a publisher, the publisher said, yes, we want to publish this. And they took on all the financial responsibility of putting it together, editing it, copy editing it, proofreading it, typesetting it, designing it, packaging it, marketing. That relationship is a content provider sells the book to the publisher and the publisher that ball and runs with it. Self-publishing is, as the name indicates, where you publish the work yourself. Uh, That means maybe you couldn't find a publisher who wanted your book, or maybe you didn't want to wait uh, the, the sometimes lengthy periods of time it can take to hear back from a publisher as to whether your book has been accepted or not. Uh, perhaps you are a, a DIY spirited kind of a person and you're like, I am just going to do this myself. Um, and then hybrid publishing is, it's, it's a little bit of both. Hybrid publishing is where you are still a lot of this has to do, let me, let me back up. A lot of this has to do with money and rights. Who owns what's rights? Who owns what rights? Excuse me. And then who, who spends the money to publish the book? Now, in self and hybrid, you're the one fronting the money. You, the author, are fronting the money. You are paying for packaging, design, etc., etc., etc. In traditional, you might even get a little money from the publisher, you might get an advance, uh, hopefully, and royalties on your on your on your sales. Um, but the financial risk, the financial burden, is on the author in self and hybrid publishing. But in traditional publishing, the financial burden is on the publisher. Now, in self publishing, you are taking on the responsibility of how is this book going to be produced? Are you going to have it professionally proofread, professionally laid out? How are you going to get it to market? Hybrid publishers, if you're not super DIY and you don't have the first idea, I almost, I I like to call it a book in a box, right? You give them your book, they design it, they lay it out, they use their marketing channels. You don't have to learn how to typeset. You don't have to contract with each individual service provider for each individual part of the publishing process. They help you along and they might even put it out under their imprint versus if you're a self-publisher, it's gonna be under your imprint, whatever you decide to call it. Um, so that's that's an upshot, you know, and of course, as far as pros and cons go, well, traditional publishing, I think that's probably every author's first choice. I mean, who wouldn't want to have one of these great storied publishers say, I would love to publish your book. You're brilliant, this is great. This is gonna be, you know, fantastic. But if you can't find a publisher that's willing to say that about your book, it doesn't necessarily mean you've got a dog of a book. It just means you didn't hit their desk on the right day. 
right? So if you've struggled to find a publisher, that doesn't mean that your, your work is not worthwhile. Let's establish that first and foremost. Um, so if you decide to self-publish, it, it could be because you don't want to wait three to five years to see your book in the marketplace. You don't want to, you know, if you, if this is something that you feel for whatever reason, your own personal mission, wh whatever that is, that you would like to see this book out in a year instead of three, self-publishing or hybrid publishing is probably the way to go because traditional publishing, the wheels of traditional publishing turn very slowly. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast. So it, there's a lot of different reasons why an author might consider one versus another. Um, you know, the cons as self and hybrid publishing, of course, you're going to be writing a lot of checks. You're, you're going to have to pay for that, you know. Um, but the pro is if you are the self publisher and you spend the money, guess who to gets to take all the profits back out at the end, right? And I have many clients who prefer self publishing because they make more money at it. And if you are trying to make a living as a writer, um, self publishing could end up being the way to go. Uh, so it's just, again, and it's, you know, there are as many paths to publishing as there are individual authors. I always say that too. That's a great answer, Erica. So let's suppose I'm one of those DIY authors uh, who doesn't want to go the traditional route. Um, you mentioned a lot about what self-publishing and hyper-publishing means, um, but I imagine that you've worked with a lot of authors and really had to manage their expectations. Oh, yeah. So what expectations should I have about the publishing process? If you going to self-publish you need to understand that you're starting a business that is number one you are starting a business you are now the writer but as the publisher you know in a traditional publishing house there is a person who sits at the very top of the structural organization and that person is typically called the publisher and that person oversees editors copy editors proofreaders designers marketers all down the line now, when you decide to self-publish, you have become that person at the top of the house. That's you now. So you have to decide, am I going to learn how to use InDesign so that I can lay out my own pages? It, maybe you're a designer already and you think I can do my own cover. Maybe you don't know the first thing about this stuff. And if you don't, and most of us don't, you're gonna to have to contract with service providers who are professionals at these things. You know, you're gonna to have to decide, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have a development editor and a proofreader, or, you know, I'm gonna get somebody to do my cover, or I'm gonna do it myself on Canva, or who lays out my pages? How do you get your book up to Amazon? Who puts it there? How, does, how do you get your book in bookstores? How do they get there? How do you get publicity? So you're taking on a lot when you decide to self-publish. Now, it all it all boils down to this. How much money do you have and how much time do you have to learn a skill? What's your base level skill set, right? If you already work in an industry where you're using InDesign every day, wow, you're leagues ahead, right? If you don't even know what the heck InDesign is, well, we're starting from a different point. <laughs> But if done correctly, I, I've said this a zillion times if I've said it once, if done correctly, the average reader cannot tell the difference between a traditionally published book and a self-published book, if done correctly. Now, what does if done correctly mean? Well, if done correctly means hiring professionals for the editing and proofreading, hiring professionals for the design, um, you know, I've had authors who thought they could do things, thought they were cover designers, and they were not. And when the book goes out to the marketplace, either the cover was so poorly done that it looked amateurish and somebody said, I'm not going to pay money for this, or the cover didn't actually represent the content of the book because it was poorly designed, or they didn't bother. I don't need a proofreader. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> you always, always, always need a proofreader. Um, and, you know, I've read, I don't know how many times I've read reviews on Amazon 
wow, this book could have been great, but there are so many typos in it that it's so distracting that I can't, I can't get into this book. And so you've defeated yourself before you've begun. So, you know, if you decide to self-publish, the expectation is you are starting a business. That is, and you are now the publisher and you are responsible for all of those moving parts. Okay, so still with my author hat on, <laughs> you've addressed a lot of key issues about self-publishing, like the financial risk, um, the business. That's, I never would have thought of it that way, that you're really going into business, but it makes sense. Um, the qualitative issues about editing and proofreading, design, that type, and the marketing. I mean, all, all of these are qualitative content issues that go into the final product. I'm sure there are some people who might be like me as an author, my pretend author that I am, that can kind of figure out some of those things. You know, you know, you don't know how to do this. You know, you don't know how to do that. So I'm wondering now, what are those unknown unknowns that I don't have? Okay. Those things that I need to be asking myself um, as I'm making that final decision about the option that I may not know very well are questions but you do because you've done a lot of work in this field. So what are those ones, those things I'm, I might stumble on, but I might not be able to anticipate. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, um, let, let's just, let's, let's play schoolhouse rock for a minute. How does a manuscript become a book? I'm just a book, <laughs> just a lonely old book. <laughs> How does that happen? Because, you know, I encounter people who, well, aren't proofreading and copy editing the same thing? No, they're not. You know, aren't marketing and sales the same thing? No, they're not. You know, and, and unfortunately, a lot of us in the industry, we don't do ourselves any credit because a lot of times we'll use terms interchangeably too. And it's very, it's very opaque to people who have never done this before, who don't know what the different even words mean. What do words mean? You know, so I'm going to explain really quickly. You have written a book. That's great. Uh, it goes through stages of editing. The first stage is development content edit. And that is where we decide that everything in this book is going to stay or some of it's going to go or you have missing pieces and we're going to add those in. Okay. You do another stage of revision. Then the book goes to either a line or a copy edit or both. This is a further polishing down of your manuscript. We're going to make sure that all the names are spelled the same on every page, that if you capitalized church on page one, it is capitalized throughout the entire book. If you are, especially in Catholic publishing, there, there is a language that we have as a church. And, and, you know, you want a professional editor who is versed in that language, who knows how to treat church documents if you have cited them in your manuscript, who knows what translation of scripture you should be using. All of those things go into this, right? and a good editor is going to know that. So then, once the, once the content is is on lock, it's all ready. Then it goes to a page designer. Okay, that person actually lays out your book. It's called typesetting. It's called page design. They usually use InDesign. They put that book together into pages. At that point, then is when it can be proofread. If I'm looking at a word file. That is not proofreading, that is copy editing. If I am looking at typeset pages in a PDF, then I'm proofreading. And what your proofreader is looking for is not just errors in the text, but also errors in the layout and design. If somebody hit a hard return twice and now you've got this much space between two paragraphs, you can't have that. If you've decided to put page numbers on every page, are they there? Are they there on every single page? Um, you know, and then cover design, your cover should match the content of what's in the book. Your cover design is an art and science in and of itself. When someone is ordering your book online and they see a tiny little thumbnail of your book cover, you need to make sure that your book cover presents just as well in that tiny little thumbnail as it does sitting on a display in full size person in a bookstore, right? Now a good cover designer is gonna know the principles that apply here. And they're going to do a fresh design, something that's not dated, something that matches the content of the book, competes in the marketplace. You know, your cover is your introduction. This is 
who I am. Hello, this is my book, you know. And then, then deeper issues of how, well, how do you get a book up on KDP? How, how do you get a book in bookstores? Do you call every Catholic bookstore in the United States and say, hello, I've published a book? Well, sure, you could do that. Uh, it would take a lot of time. But are you willing to pay for marketing, publicity? How do you promote your book? Because if a book lands on Amazon and no one is there to read it, has it really made an impact? No, it has not. So, you know, there's all steps to the process. Most of my self-publishing uh, clients will employ me for the front end editing, the development line editing part, and then other providers for copy editing and proofreading. Usually the person who designs your pages can also design your cover, but not necessarily. I have one client who actually likes doing the interiors, so he does the interiors himself, and mm -hmm. then he lets a designer do the cover, and that's great. And almost all of my clients who are successful contract with a marketing company that helps independent authors get their books on shelves in people's hands, because isn't that the point? You know, you've written this book, you have this personal mission, you want to, you, whatever your message is, you want to get it in the most hands possible. Um, and so that takes professional effort to do. Um, it's not, it's, it's complex, but if you've done it as long as I have, it's not that complex, but it's still complex. And it's especially complex if you've never done it before. Um, you know, but that's why you reach out to things like ACP. Uh, right? Because you can get those answers to questions because it's, it's big and scary, but it doesn't have to be. That makes a lot of sense, Erica. That was a ton of sense. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking back on my own background, working with the Bishop's Conference in the publishing office and a couple things. One, you, you mentioned about making sure that during the copying process that churches capitalized throughout those types of things. Um, and one of the things I wanted to share with our listeners is that there is a style guide that exists for Catholic content um, that actually as ACP, we're the ones that distribute it. It's free of charge, but it helps you make those decisions about what things are capitalized, how they're, uh, what terms are used for what purpose and in what context. So I would definitely encourage anyone who is uh, who's concerned about those issues and want to make sure that the script is as clean as possible and consistent as possible to check out the catholicpublishers.org website and take a look at that style guide. It's just a download. So that was one thing. The other is, uh, are there like, are there special things I need to know? For example, if I'm writing, especially nonfiction that, I'm talking about something about like the theology or doctrine of the church. Yes. What are some, like, what are the top two or three things I really need to, to know when I'm doing that and when I'm getting ready to move forward, publishing something like that? There is something that if you own any Catholic books, which I hope you do, uh, if you open up to uh, the front pages of the book, you'll see a word called imprimatur. And it's usually in, in italics, and that's because it is Latin, our good buddy Latin. And um, that is where a priest or bishop actually reviews the content of your manuscript to make sure there is no heresy in it. And we don't want that. Um, when I worked at Franciscan Media, which is where I got my start in Catholic publishing, I was introduced to this process, and I was unfamiliar with it. But it actually, your book will be reviewed and to make sure that there is nothing in it that is against Catholic teaching or tradition. And it's very important when you are doing nonfiction and when you are tacking, tackling theology and doctrine, you know, those capital letter issues, that you do have the manuscript vetted. And that is, you know, one of the main differences between self and traditional Catholic publishing, you know, the, the vetting that happens for a book. You know, if your book is a general spirituality book, you know, and you're not taking on doctrine, then that's one thing. But if you are, if you know, say you have, you might have a theology degree and you, and you do want to do this. Um, I just recently read a fantastic blog uh, by another ACP member, Jeanette Fastragman. 
she actually took that topic, the topic of imprimatur, and broke it down in Lang language, uh, which she's fantastic. And that's not surprising to me because she's a great editor. Um, and I would recommend that if you are going to especially self-publish a nonfiction book that has to do with doctrine, that you understand that process because it's a biggie. Um, the other thing that you need to understand is copyright law. This is a big one yeah. and we could do an entire podcast just on that, but I will, I will nutshell it this way. If you quote material from someone else's work in your book, you need to get permission from the copyright holder for that material. And just because you found it on an internet quote aggregator doesn't mean that it's fair use. Uh, if you are putting material that you didn't create into your book and you plan to sell that book, that becomes commercial use. That requires permission. Don't get yourself in trouble. Uh, when in doubt, ask. That That's the rule of thumb <laughs> on that one. That's, I'm glad you mentioned the copyright one. We have a, a recording of a webinar that was done by one of the leading experts in Catholic publishing on the topic, uh, Mary Elizabeth Sperry, yeah. at, uh, at the catholicpublishers.org website under our webinar. So, and that is a very important topic and editors stumble on it all the time because there's it's really nuanced in some ways, but it's really important because nobody wants to get into trouble using content previously created content that is not their own. So I definitely recommend for nonfiction um, authors who are listening, go and take a look at that webinar so you can get a background. Mary Elizabeth does a really good job of explaining things in a way that's very understandable. Um, and if we can convince her, maybe we'll get her to come over here and, and talk with us a little bit about it because it's one of her favorite topics. Oh, that would be wonderful because she is an expert. I bow down to her. I was a permissions manager at Franciscan Media early in my career, and she got many, many emails and letters from me back in the day <laughs> because but it is there. Okay. Okay, so we, I, we were talking there a little bit about nonfiction, which kind of leads me to my next question. And that is, what types of Catholic publishing are best suited for self-publishing? And which ones are better suited for traditional publishing? Traditional publishing is your, what I call your capital letter books. Tradition, scripture, church, you know. Um, if you if if you have a degree in theology and you are tackling a theological subject, if your book is something that you would want to be taught in a class at a seminary or in a in a college level theology class, you really want to try to go the traditional route for that because in the marketplace, authority vetting matters for those types of books. You know. So like anything that's regarding any of the sacraments, yes. especially right now, you know, talk about Eucharist. Eucharist is always a popular one. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Makes right. a lot of sense. And, and for self-publishing, those are, if you have a personal prayer practice that has, you know, opened up your spirituality, but you're not really teaching theology or doctrine. You're just sharing your own personal spiritual testimony about this is how I pray the rosary and I do it every day. And when I did it every day, this is what happened in my life. Those sorts of, it's, I don't want to call it touchy feely, but that sort of just general spirituality sharing, it's almost like a spiritual memoir kind of, those kinds of books could be could be self-published um and i actually have a client who has self-published several uh catholic fiction novels and that's a segment of the market that i would love to see more of because catholics like to read books too uh you know i have a client who does catholic historical fiction and it you know it's it's they're the perfect books to self-publish because people love fiction series genre fiction does very well in self-publishing there are a lot of self-publishers who are working in a genre fiction whether it's sci-fi fantasy historical romance etc cetera, etc cetera. and those are the kind of books where you create a series and your readers love it and they want to they want to know what happens next what, what happens next what happens next and those sorts of things where you're not really 
taking on the mantle of church teaching and you're not trying to actually, you know, it's not an academic sort of book. Um, that lends itself better to self-publishing than those other sorts of more academic or more theological kind of books. Would. That makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about one of the more practical or two more practical issues. How do the timelines and costs differ between the different types of publishing? And you mentioned earlier, if you want to make a job as a writer, what is the potential for income? Is it possible? Um, can I expect to actually make a living if I either self-publish or traditional publish? Um, what those are, those are sometimes the things that I think are most basic for most of us, most potential authors. Right. So first of all, um, none of us got into publishing to become rich. Okay. That's number one. Okay. Uh, you know, I was, I, I'll share with you a, a humorous anecdote about my past. I was a theater major when I went to college and I had everybody in my ears. You'll never make any money. You'll never make a living. You'll be starving your entire life. So I always make the joke that I switched over to an English major and got a literature and writing degree because there's a money making field. Uh, no, <laughs> um, nobody gets into publishing to make big bucks. Now everybody has the stars in their eyes and sees the anomalies, you know, of, of, of the biggest names in publishing who have, you know, multiple New York Times bestsellers. And that's great. And I'm not saying that that's not possible for you as an author. I will never say that because we don't know what's possible until we try. Now, there is what is theoretically possible and what is uh, statistically probable, right? And uh, never the twain shall meet. Most authors who make a living at their work um, really have to hustle. I mean, you really have to hustle. And, but it is possible, right? It's not impossible. But as far as, you know, I'm going to sell a million copies of my book and spend the rest of my days writing from the beach, eh, probably not. Now, in traditional publishing, Catholic publishing particularly, we need to look at what Catholic publishing is. You have general, broad market publishing. You have Christian publishing. Then you have Catholic publishing. Catholic publishing is a niche within a niche. Okay. Our market segment is not huge. And so you need to know that going in and adjust your expectations accordingly. You know, when I was working at Franciscan Media, we were doing small print runs and small advances. And you're talking, you know, a thousand copies on a print run of some books, you know, maybe 5,000 of another. Now that was a long time ago and I don't know what their print runs are now and I'm not speaking for them, but that is just my experience working for a Catholic traditional publisher. Smaller print runs, smaller royalties, you know, because again, the Catholic market share in publishing in general is not that huge. Um, now you are going to have to market your book, no matter who publishes it. That's something that you as an author, if you want to take this journey and, and publish your work, you need to get comfortable with public speaking. You need to get comfortable with promoting your own work because even if you get traditionally published, most in-house marketing staffs are very small and very overloaded. And so you're still going to have a box of books in your trunk and you're going to be toting around to parishes and you're going to be trying to get speaking engagements and you're going to be doing, you know, webcasts and podcasts like we're doing today and promoting your work. Get comfortable promoting your work. And there are ways to do that. You don't have to be an off the charts extrovert razzle dazzle type to promote your book there there are very you know tried and true ways that you can market your work um and you don't have to be extraordinarily comfortable in public as some of us are but you will have to do it and that is something that you do need to expect and of course the more you're willing to market your work the more you're willing to promote your message the more you are willing the more books you will sell and the more income you will make so if you are looking at this as something as I want to do this and make a living at it. You need to get really comfortable with that fact. You're going to have to push your own work. Um, you can make, you know, a contract with a traditional publisher is going to break down what your advances are. And it's going to, it's going to break down what your royalty rate is. An advance is exactly that. That is an advance in anticipation 
of future sales. Now, if you follow publishing circles at all, you've probably heard the term earn out. What does that mean? Have you earned out your advance? So say you sign a contract with a traditional publisher and they give you a $5,000 advance. That's an advance of your book sales. You don't start earning royalties until you've sold $5,000 worth of books. Now, if you think about the average paperback cover price being 15 bucks, you can start to do the math, right? And figure out how much you will actually earn per book. And it's not a ton. Now, again, I don't mean to be discouraging, I, but you do need to have realistic expectations, you know, of what the money in is like. Now, if you're a self-publisher, okay. So, to self-publish a book and do it well, you better have a budget of at least $5,000. That's, that's baseline because you're going to have to pay your service providers and freelancers. Uh, contrary to the name, we are not free. So you, <laughs> you do have to pay your freelancers and pay them well, and pay them on time and pay them fairly. Um, and you're probably going to, if you've never hired a freelancer before, you're probably going to be in for some sticker shock. If a freelancer is a self-employed person, that means they are self-employed, which means we have to cover our own social security tax, our own self-employment tax, social security, Medicare, all that stuff. All that stuff that your employer typically takes out of your paycheck, well, that's me. So I get to pay an extra 15%. That all goes into my hourly rate. If you hire someone who has 20 plus years of experience, they're gonna charge for that too. So you need to, there are a number of ways that you can kind of create a budget for how much these things will cost. I always refer people to the Editorial Freelancers Association, of which I am a member. Um, they just put out a brand new rate chart uh, for 2024, and they break down how much you can budget for development editing, copy editing, all these different things to give you a clue. But you need to have a budget, and you need to have a budget before you go out into the marketplace looking to hire people. And you need to be prepared to know what you personally are willing to spend to do this. Um, and if you do that, you'll be set up for success. If you kind of go into it blindly and, you know, again, sticker shock is a thing. I've had people who I've given quotes to for editing and they're like, oh, wow, I had no idea. Like, well, that's how much it costs. Uh, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I don't charge as much as some people do, certainly. Uh, again, that whole not here to get rich thing. But you do need to expect to pay people for their services because that's the thing to do. Um, so as an economic prospect, as with anything, know what you're willing to spend. It's the same thing as going to buy a car, you know? Know what you're willing to spend. Know what is available to you. Know how much financial risk you're willing to take. And, you know, on the traditional side, know that an advance is just that. It's not, it's sort of money, but it's sort of not money. And your book needs to earn that money back. And so either way, traditional or self, you're going to be the one hustling to make those margins. So buckle up and get ready. <laughs> you talked a lot about in that answer about service providers. So I want to pick up on that. How do you find them? You mentioned like the Freelance Editors Association for editorials. So how do I, if I'm an author, how do I find those professionals? And then how do I vet them? How do I know that they're better, who's better than somebody else? So often those decisions end up being about price. You know, this is the cheapest, this person's the cheapest, uh, but that may not necessarily, it may equate with quality and it may not. Um, so what are, what, what would be we like your maybe top three key pointers of things I need to do as I'm starting to talk to professional service providers? Right. Um, EFA and um, the ACES, and I always get their name wrong, but it's the top. EFA is Editorial Freelancers Association, right? Editorial Freelancers Association and the Association of Copy Editors, ACES. I'm a member of both of those. Um, there are lots of if you start googling which you know we all do uh there are lots of editing associations and designers if you're doing children's books i know a lot of people want to do children's books the society scbwi more alphabet suit soup uh is uh the society for children's books writers and illustrators um 
do some research and find those. But once you've decided, okay, I'm talking to, I will use the example of editing because that is what I am and that is what I know. So you've, you've done your Google searches and you've found A, B, and C, editor A, B, and C. You know, C is the cheapest, A is the most expensive, B is in the middle. What questions do you ask? What, you know, what, first of all, what kind of credentials does this person have? Does this person have a degree in English literature and writing? Or do they have a degree in sports medicine? Like this matters, you know, do they have a degree at all? And I'm not, and I'm not an academic snob at all. I am a, I'm a proud first gen kid from a state school, you know, and I've, I've built a career on the back of my degree, but they should have experience and education in the field of writing and publishing. Um, I just like certifications that some of these uh, fields have or certificates that, that some of the, some of these professionals work towards to give them more experience. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking back to my own publishing days where a couple of the designers I knew, for example, they went and got certificates that were through either Microsoft or Google or in Adobe, which is the maker of InDesign that says that they've reached a certain level of qualitative expertise. Are those relevant are they do they exist in up in in any of these fields they do and and i think that they can help i think that the overarching thing as far as education goes you want to make sure you're working with somebody who not only has a base you know level of education but has shown the fact that they keep their credentials up to date because as you know publishing changes every single minute of every single day and, and what were the standards five years ago are not the standards now. And so if somebody hasn't updated their certifications or credentials in 20 years, eh, that's a question I would ask, you know. But the other thing too is work experience because you know this. Getting your hands in there up to the elbows in a book project sometimes is the best way to learn, right? And I have, I have a degree and I have continuing education, but I also have a ton of on the job experience. I have worked on, somebody asked me how many books I've worked on in the past 24 years, and I couldn't come up with a total. It's a lot, you know? And I've kind of seen every every way that a book can go. Um, and I've done everything on a book from the, the, the front end to the back end too across my career. I understand that I'm a rare bird. I Most professionals don't have the vastness of experience we'll put it that way to be polite that i do some people look at my resume and they're like wow you've done all kinds of stuff where do i put you and you know but that that breadth of experience for me has made me a better professional right when you are thinking about working with an editor first of all that's a relationship if you don't feel like you click with your editor it's not going to be a good process you know, request a discovery call. And it, and if a freelance editor is worth their salt, they will do a call with you and they will answer your questions and they will do it cheerfully and they will do it helpfully. And if you don't feel like you're getting that from someone, they're probably not somebody you want to work with. There, there's so much uh, with, this, with this process that, you know, price is just one piece of it. You want to make sure someone has a background in the genre that you're working in too, because there are different conventions for every genre of book that you could potentially write. You know, I, there are definitely types of books that I don't work on because even though I'm a book professional, I'm not an expert in that genre. So you want to make sure that this person has actually worked on books like yours. Ask them for examples, ask them for Amazon links, um, you know, and, Interview, basically, interview a book service provider the same way you would vet any service provider. You're not going to take your car to the first garage that pops up. You're not going to have, if you're hiring a lawn care service, you're going to ask those guys questions. It's the same principle. Anyone that you're going to pay for a service, ask them the questions. And there are no bad questions. There are no wrong questions. If you don't understand something, ask the question. And again, if the service provider doesn't answer that question helpfully and cheerfully, you probably want to look for a different provider. That's great advice. So speak 
speaking of advice, we're at that point where I wanted to ask any last thoughts or advice uh, for authors who are discerning that choice between traditional and self-publishing. Thinking like, I'm in that position, what's the last thought you want to keep in my mind that I like take away from this conversation? I think that it comes down to, you know, whether you choose to traditionally publish or whether you choose to, to self-publish comes down to, again, that is a very personal choice. It comes down to what are you willing to pay for? What are you willing to learn to do yourself? Um, what matters most to you as an author? Does it matter more to you that you get the validation of being published traditionally? Does it matter less to you who publishes it and you just have a personal mission to get this story out into the world? Um, and again, I said it before, there are as many paths to publishing as there are individual authors. And it's, a, it, it's an important choice though. But really in the end, only you can discern which one is going to be better for you. There's a degree of patience that is required for both. Um, and, you know, it's going to come down to your timeline, your budget, and your mission for publishing. And only you can answer that question. Um, but the good thing is, is that if you are not sure what to do, there are so many resources in the Catholic writing and publishing community that you can call on for advice and help. And it's one of the reasons why when you told me you were starting this podcast, I was absolutely thrilled because this is going to be so helpful to people who are in this space and who maybe don't know as much as they need to. And they're going to, to figure that out. And I think that's great. The more knowledge that we can share as a writing and publishing community, it benefits all of us. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of room at the table for anyone who feels like they have a story to tell. And, you know, I, I love that about the fact that self-publishing is now an option, you know, 20 years ago, it was, it was in its nascency. And now, you know, it's more popular. It's easier than ever to publish. Um, and that can be a good or a bad thing, but I like to view it as a good thing um, because that means that more voices can be heard. And I think that's the most important thing at the end of the day about all of this. And I think it's why we do what we do, right? We want to share our stories. We want to share our faith. We want to share the knowledge about our church and who we are. So it's, it's going to take work. There are going to be peaks and valleys as with anything. Um, but if you have the grit and you have the patience, um, it can be a very rewarding experience and you can do a lot of good for the world with your story. So don't get discouraged. That's number one thing. Don't get discouraged because this is a discouraging business. Um, but if you have a realistic expectation and you have a strong personal mission, you can be successful and you can get your story out. I love that idea of getting your story out there and that there's a lot of, a lot of places at the table. That's a, what a great Catholic image for us. Thank you, Erica, for sharing your expertise with us today. Before we close, here are a few suggestions for you, our listeners. If you are an author, join the Association of Catholic Publishers as a content creator member to network with other Catholic publishing professionals. You can go to catholicpublishers.org and click on members and join now. If you are an editor or would like to get more in-depth editing consulting, contact Erica at her website at ericamcintyre.com. That's E-R-I-C-K-A-M-C-I-N-T-Y-R-E.com. We are here to help guide you in your journey in Catholic publishing. So watch more episodes in this series or explore other series here at catholicpublishers.org. Thank you to you as our listeners and viewers for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Comment below as it really helps with the algorithm and share this episode on your favorite social media platform. We'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions for super future episodes. So feel free to reach out to us on Facebook, X, LinkedIn, and YouTube, or at our website at catholicpublishers.org. 
We hope you found this informative and enjoyable. We sure did. So be sure to join us next time for another exciting conversation on Catholic publishing. And you won't want to miss our next episode featuring an insightful discussion on scams in self-publishing. Whether you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform or watching us on YouTube, be sure to tune in for another engaging episode. I've been your host, Therese Brown, and we'll see you next time on Catholic Publishing 101. God bless you and your ministry.